Hi, my name is Tanner, and thank you for taking the Introduction to Python programming course. Uh, I'm really excited, so let's get right into it. Who is this class for? Uh, it's really for anyone who's interested in learning how to program. Um, people who want to get right into the code instead of installing a bunch of stuff, uh, I, we go right into it using an online compiler, so all you need is access to the internet. And ideally, you know, it's for people who don't have any prior programming knowledge or very little because we're going to get really basic and go over the very fundamentals of programming. So the structure of the course, uh, we're first going to, you know, get started, learn the compiler we're going to use, and just basics of programming, learning variables, um, and different data types in Python. Then we're going to go into logic and loops and how we can use those uh, in our algorithms. We're then going to go into functions, defining functions, creating our own and calling them. Uh, then we're going to go into recursion a little bit. And then we're going to go into the basics of object-oriented programming and understanding why we actually create objects in programming and what they're really useful for. And what if you have any questions? Well, first, Google is your friend. Don't be afraid to Google anything. Uh, chances are if you have the, a question, someone else has also had that question, and there's probably an answer somewhere online. Uh, Stack Overflow is great, so when you Google a question, a lot of the time Stack Overflow will be one of the first threads that pop up in your search. It's a great resource. Uh, and then you can also ask in the Q&A section of this class, and either another student or I will uh, help and answer the question for you. So, uh, I'm excited. Let's start and get right into it. So, we're going to look at what programming is, okay? Because it could be kind of confusing. You hear it a lot, but what actually is programming? So, programming is simply just telling a computer that you want to do something, okay? So, a computer has a different language than you do. So, think of yourself when you're a programmer as a translator. So you're translating from human language to uh, computer language and telling it exactly what you want it to do. There are many ways to do this using different, different computer programming languages. We're going to be focusing on Python, but there's a lot of different ones such as C++, JavaScript, Ruby, Fortran, Swift, a lot of different ones that can do a lot of different things. Um, Python is one of my personal favorites, but remember there are a lot out there and there's, uh, you know, a lot of people use them to do different things. So what does a programmer do? They're the ones that implement tasks via the computer. And like I said, you're going to think of yourself as a translator. How can I translate my own human language into something a computer can understand and implement? Okay. So let's look at an example, okay? I want to be able to give the computer a list of numbers, and then I want it to return a sum of the numbers. We can do it in Python using the following. We can define our numbers as 1.2, 3.4, 5.6, 1.33. We're going to initialize our sum as 0, and then we're going to loop through those numbers, okay? So for every number, we're going to add it to the sum, and we're going to print out that sum. And in that case, if we were to add all the values and numbers, we get 11.53. All right. So just like we said, we first define our list of numbers, hold the sum, and then we could actually check if we were right. Okay. So 1.2 plus 3.4 plus 5.6 plus 1.33. And that gets 11.53. All right. So this is the end of this video. And we're going to start going into Python code. Hi, so we're going to jump right into Python. There's a lot of different tutorials on how to install Python on your computer if you wanted to uh, play with it locally or code locally. But just to jump right into the code, we're going to use an online compiler, and that's going to be at repl, R-E-P-L dot I-T. Once you go to this website, you'll scroll down and you'll have a bunch of languages. So this is actually a great resource uh, going forward if you want to learn JavaScript or let's say Node.js. Um, I haven't used it for Node, but I, you know, it, it's great on almost every single uh, language I use it for. So let's jump right into Python. So right away, there's a few different things I want to talk about. Right here is where our files are. And if you have an, a text editor locally, it'll look very similar. Where you have a list of your files, this one's called main.py. This is your actual Python 
file and it has a .py extension, that means it's a Python file. And that's why you, if you wanted to work on it locally on your own computer, you would need to install Python so that it understands what to do with these .py files. Then you have this area all over here, and that's your console. That's where the output's going to go. That's where um, when whatever you do here and you print to a console, it'll go right over here. Um, we're going to use that a lot. Uh, so when you hear the term console, you know this is what you'll uh, be referring to, and the actual script will be right here. Uh, thank you. And the next one, we will go right into coding. So let's jump right into coding. We're gonna do our first program called Hello World. It's kind of the industry standard for learning how to code. Type in print, open parentheses, and a lot of the time uh, your compiler will close the parentheses that you open. So in REPL.IT it will do that. You do quotes. In Python you could use either double quotes or you can do single quotes. Type in Hello World exclamation point. So what print is, is a built-in Python function. Uh, when we actually cover building our own functions, it'll make a little bit more sense. Uh, but it, what it'll do is print anything you put in those parentheses into the console on the right over here. So if we were to click run, it's going to compile the code. And if you look on the right side, it'll say hello world. So that's you know how you how you code you just created your first program um we're going to get obviously into a little bit more interesting uh, programming things but right now that's all you need to know and you made your own first program let's start variables right now a variable broadly speaking is simply a piece of information that the computer stores very basic generally speaking if we wanted to create a variable in python let's say my variable equals one what does this do this tells python i want to be able to reference the value one whenever i type my variable so why not just type one well now if we wanted to change the value of my variable we could put two here and every single time we reference my variable it'll change that value to two. So it's very, very powerful. When we create variables in Python, we don't need to do any keywords like var or even the type of the variable, which we'll get into in the next couple lectures. Uh, and we just say the name that you want equals and the variable that you want. That's it. So let's go right into other variables. Now that we've covered the basic idea of variables, let's get into our first variable type, which is a Boolean. A Boolean is simply true or false, and it saves that value of true or false. So if I wanted to say my bool, that you may hear people say bool, equals true, then every time we reference my bool, we're gonna get the value of true. If we were to say my other bool equals false, then it's going to save the value of false. True and false are keywords in Python, uh, and you just do it with a capital T and a capital F, no quotes or anything, and it'll get the value true or false. We were to print my or a type of my bool and run, we get class my bool or class bool. It's a boolean. So Python, when you type in those keywords, true or false, is automatically going to save it as a, a Boolean. That's one of the cool things about Python, and we're going to learn more about that, that you don't need anything. You just need the variable name and the value. Okay, now let's get into instant floats. We're going to start working with uh, integers and floats, so let's get right into it. If we wanted to define an integer, we just write the name of the variable. We'll say variable 1 equals 1. Let's do variable two equals two and in python you don't need anything like semicolons at the end you just type them out do enter uh white space matters more than anything like semicolons and we'll see that as we go forward uh so let's do print variable one plus variable two we get three so python knows that you're getting it two numbers when you do variable one plus variable two it's going to return the sum of them which is one plus two three pretty straightforward. Uh, notice that Python knows that it is a type int. An integer is just any whole number. So when you just type in one, 
we'll do type let's run it and you get class int so Python right away knows that you are giving it uh, type int let's go into floats now we can do point zero here and point zero here if we were to run that we get class float and the reason that matters is because right when you give a decimal space to an integer it becomes a float all float is the number just like an integer but it's a non whole number and now i know what you may be thinking 1.0 is the same as one but when you put that decimal place in python automatically realizes that there's a decimal place therefore it's a float it doesn't matter if we view it as empty or if it's a zero python will automatically say hey this is a float so if we were to do variable one plus variable two it's still going to be of class float and if we were to give just print out the answer it'll be 3.0 instead of just three where if we were to get rid of them it's three so when you give it a whole number it'll recognize it as an int and when you give it a decimal it'll recognize it as a float with floats and ints you can do any arithmetic operators you can do addition let's do multiplication here perfect uh, and you could do the same thing here 1.0 and it'll once again return a float because you're doing multiplication with floats so that's a quick introduction to ints and floats nothing too crazy here um, main thing to remember is how to define a variable you have the name variable one which holds the value 1.0 so whenever you refer to variable one such as right here it will take that number 1.0 and the same thing with variable two whenever you refer to variable two it'll refer to 2.0 so that's basically it for ints and floats thank you now that we looked at basic variable types like integers and floats let's look at a string a string is simply a collection of letters so let's say my underscore string equals hello world run it we're not going to do anything but it's going to save the value hello world in my string if we were to do print my string run it recognizes okay my string equals hello world so it's going to print out hello world if we were to use type my string and run you get class string so it, just like we used type before and it gave class int float this is of type string so and the way python recognizes it is just a collection of letters and you define it using quotes you can use either double quotes or single quotes in python they mean the same thing and it'll still be of type string so let's do something uh really simple and combine two strings this is a very common thing that you'll use in python so let's use exclamation e did i spell that right i i, I wasn't too good at english equals that an exclamation point and we're going to print my string plus exclamation all right what do you think is going to happen here it's going to append or concatenate those two strings so my string plus exclamation is going to concatenate the value my string plus an uh, exclamation point so it'll put it right next to each other hello world there's a very common way to uh, combine two strings or multiple strings if you had another one you could just do plus again there's a lot of different things you could do a lot of built-in python functions um, that you could look into strings are you know very very uh widely used obviously and notice that when we defined these two strings one of them used single quotes the other one used double quotes and when you concatenate them there's no issues because python views those as the same way that's it for strings and let's go to the next video now that we've really gone through the basic data types in python we're going to go into some that are a little bit more complex and quite frankly are much more relevant um, in what you'll be doing uh, for most of the time so 
let's go into tuples. And a tuple is simply a collection of data that's ordered. So it's more than one piece of data that you combine and save into one variable, which you can then reference. What does that mean? Let's figure it out. So let's do my underscore tuple equals parentheses one, two, three. This is how you define a tuple with parentheses and you use commas between the two. If we were to do print my tuple, it'll print out one comma two comma three. Let's look at type. Class tuple. Just like all the other data types, when you type create a tuple, Python automatically recognizes that and saves that so you don't need to do anything special. And now the cool thing with tuples and what we'll learn in lists next is that you can reference each value individually. So if we wanted the first value in my tuple, what would we type? We say my tuple, we use these braces, and then we're not going to type one. What we want is the first value at using an index. So the indexing starts at zero, which is very, very, very important. Most all languages that I can think of, unless there's some one-off language, start indexing at zero. So if we're to type in zero here, it's going to get whatever is in the first position or position zero in my tuple. So value of one. Now let's try something interesting. Let's do type my tuple. What do you think is gonna happen here? It's class int. So what my tuple is, is a data type in and of itself. It's a tuple, but it's saving three integer values inside of which, which you can then reference. So if we wanted to add whatever's in position zero, so that's one with, let's say, the number two, we're going to do plus my tuple. And if we want number two, that's going to be in position one. And let's run it. We get three. Okay. And then if we wanted to do plus my tuple in the two, it's going to be one plus two plus three, which will be six. So that's how you do, uh, or that's how you create tuples, work with them, uh, indexing using, you know, zero in the very first position, then one in the second position. It's a little confusing, but it'll, you'll get the hang of it very quickly. Uh, okay, so let's get into lists now. All right, now that we covered tuples, we're gonna cover another piece of uh, data that's very similar to tuples, um, but quite frankly, is probably used a lot more or has a lot more uh, applications at the list. Let's get started. So we're gonna define my list equals braces, one, two, three, four, five. Now let's print my list and it's gonna print the list. Uh, just like we do in tuples, we start referencing at zero. So in my list in the zero index will be value one. Okay. If we were to do type my list, we get class list. Once again, it's a built in uh, data type in Python. And now with lists, there are, I mean, with a lot of data types, there's a lot of added um, methods that you can do. And with lists, no different. So let's start off with append, okay? Let's say we have this list of values. So one, two, three, four, five, and we say, oh, I wanted to add the number six at the end. We can simply do my list dot append, and then put whatever value you want to append in here. So we can do six, say print, my list and run now we have the value six in my list so very very common to use that uh we can also use a lot of different types of indexing uh which we didn't really go into with tuples but let's start getting into it so if i wanted to reference number five okay we could use my list in the four and it's going to print five. But what if we don't know exactly what or the length of the list? You know, there could be a bunch of different values in there and you don't know what index the last value is. Well, you can say negative one. 
print and it'll be five because what this is doing is going zero and then wrapping back around to the negative one index so if you do negative one it'll be the last value if you want to do the second to last value you would do negative two run that and you got four okay so you could do a few different things with it let's say you wanted to get a, a section of your list so if we were to type in colon three we get one two three so this means it's going to get all of the values up to the one that's in uh, position three. So that in position three, we have the value four. So it's going to get zero, one, and two, and return that, okay? So our values in positions zero, one, and two are one, two, and three. And the reason I made the numbers different is just to kind of show you how it works if we wanted to we can just change this let's go zero comma one comma two so it's going to get the one the values in index zero one and two so all the way up to three let's run it and it's going to be zero one and two just because the index is also you know we, we made the values match the index in this case so that will help explain that let's say we did one colon what do you think this is going to do this will get all the values in the in the in the array including and after everything in the first position okay so it's going to be one or the first index equal one sorry not the first position index equals one so one two three four five and that's it so those are a couple ways to do that we can also combine those two where if we want to do one to three what do you think is going to happen it's going to return one and two because it'll be everything up uh, including and after index one and up to index three so that'll be one and two if we were to do pr uh, print type of this all it's doing is returning another list so let's go into another very common Python data type that you'll use a lot called a dictionary. Uh, you'll hear it referred to as a dict, D-I-C-T. Uh, it's a type of hash table or hash map you'll hear um, it referred to as in other programming languages. And what it is is a collection of key and values. So let's create one called my dict. You construct one using these curly braces and you're gonna put some key with a colon and then some value with the comma to separate each uh, entry in the dict. So just like an array where you're gonna push your um, entry separated by commas, uh, in a dictionary, you're gonna say key colon value with commas. Okay, so let's say key, and then we'll say key two, and we're gonna say value two. Okay, so uh, let's see how we would refer to these you're to print out my dict you use just like uh, you would be referencing a, a value in a list you use those braces and you put the uh, name of the key so if we run this we will get value okay and that's because my dict in this key called key is going to be a uh, value if we were to print my vic my dict in the key two and run it, it would be value two. And we could put any value in here. If we wanted to put, you know, motor cycle and banana, you would just say my dict in the motorcycle and run it, and you get banana, right? Because here's the key and here's the value. All right? And the cool thing about dicts is that you can uh, mix different values. So let's say we're going to say uh, put key three and we can put an int. We could also put some other key and put 4.7, right? You can put a float in there as well. So if we were to say key three and print it, you get four. If we put some other key and run it, you get 4.7. If you were to say type of some other key, 
or dict in my some other key, what do you think is going to happen? We should see float. And that's exactly what we see. We see class float. So that's an introduction to dicts. Um, as you go through a Python, you're going to be using them a lot. It's really good to understand how they work. Uh, that's it for this one. Welcome to the logic and loop section of this course, and this is what we're going to learn. Let's say we have a list of numbers, and we want to deter determine which numbers in this list, and then print them out, which numbers are divisible by 3. So when we get the remainder, so item modulo 3, it's 0. Okay? So we could do that manually by checking each one. You know, say, okay, so 6, 3, 9. Okay, so there's three numbers. We want to be able to print out 6, 3, and 9. We can go in there manually and just say print over and over. Or we can loop through and conditionally check if each one is. So this is going to loop through every item in my list, check if it's divisible by 3, and then print out the item. So if we're going to run it, we get 6, 3, and 9. Okay? Don't worry too much about what this means. Uh, it's just going to give you a little bit more context of what we'll learn in this section. Okay, let's get into it. Thank you for continuing to watch this course. And we're going to get right into if statements. If statements are really great because it allows you to do <clears throat> tasks conditionally if one thing is true or one thing is false. So let's get right into it. Generally speaking, your syntax is going to start with an if. And then you're going to have some sort of logic here. So let's put... 5 plus 5 equals 10, colon, and then you're going to do something. So let's look at this a little bit more. It is going to evaluate whatever you put here, okay? So it's asking, is 5 plus 5 10? And notice we have two equals, because we're not assigning a value of 10. If you saw some variable, we typically will write my var equals 10, right? And this is because we're defining the variable to be to hold the value of 10. In this situation, we're just checking if 5 plus 5 equals 10. And the way we do that syntactically in Python is to use two equals, okay? So if 5 plus 5, let's delete this, equals 10, we're going to print we are inside the if block. Let's run it and see, there you go. We are inside the if block. Okay. And that's it. So the syntax, remember, is if put some thing to evaluate in here with a colon, then you indent in the if statement and you put whatever you want to do. And you could put as much stuff as you want. You could say print I am before the second print line. The important thing though, see, and it'll work, but it only works if they're all indented the same amount. So that's very important to keep in mind, okay? Uh, so let's get into the elf, else part of if statements. What if this part isn't true? So let's say is not equal to 10. And the way that is is exclamation point equals 10. What this does is check if whatever you're evaluating is not equal to 10. Then we're going to say we are inside the if block again. We get nothing, right? Because 5 plus 5 is equal to 10. So it's not going to even enter this block because this just said if 5 plus 5 is not equal to 10, so this is going to be false. This part right here is false. 5 plus 5 is not equal to 10. And you could say that out loud. We know that that's a false statement, so it's not going to go there. So if we go to else we could say print we are inside the else block okay and if we were to run this we will get we are inside the else block because it's checking if this is true okay this isn't true else you're going to do this else uh, blocks are not mandatory for if statements as we just saw you could do an if statement without an else okay one more thing we could do is elif or else if you'll hear um in other programming languages, uh, you, there's a lot of different syntaxes for it, but it goes elif in uh, Python, and then it's going to have some sort of logic in here. So we'll say 5 plus 5 equals 10. Then we're going to say print, we are inside the elif block. Okay? And the elif block is the exact same thing as the, elf, uh, the if statement, 
but it's just elif and then you put whatever you want to evaluate now the else is going to happen regardless so you don't put anything in here for the else statement you don't need to, it's not evaluating anything it's just defaulting to that if everything else above here is false so what do you think is going to happen in this just try to think about it and that will let's run it it's going to say we're in the elif block right because it first goes okay is five plus five not equal to ten no that's this part's false this statement's false elif five plus five equals to ten Oh, that, that is true. So now we're going to execute this, and then we don't even hit the else because it's already evaluated this if block. Okay? So if we're going to do one more thing and say 5 plus 5 equals 9. So if 5 plus 5 is not equal to 10, we are inside the, else, the if block. Elif, 5 plus 5 equals to 9. Well, that's not true. So it's going to skip this, and it's going to keep on going. So if we were to run, we should get we are inside the else block, right? Because this false false so by default it goes to the else if we were to get rid of this what do you think is going to happen nothing because it, neither of these are true okay so it's just not going to do anything because it, it can't go inside of those blocks all right so that's it for if statements this is you know much more technical than the other ones we've gone through uh you know it's good to practice with a lot of different scenarios so that's what i would suggest and uh you know there's obviously a lot more we can do with determining these um right here we could do gr greater than or equal we could do less than or equal we could just do less than so feel free to play around with a lot of different things okay now that we've learned if statements, we're going to look at a practical application of it. It's a common coding exercise called FizzBuzz. So the general idea is that we want to write a script so that if we give or we input a number that is divisible by three, we print fizz in the console. If a number is divisible by five, we're going to print buzz in the console. And if a number is divisible by both three and five, we're going to print fizzbuzz. So let's first by defining a couple numbers, okay? We're gonna say number one equals four, number two equals six, number three equals 10, and number four equals 15. So if we look at it right off the bat, we know that this will just input the number, return the number back, okay? should print four because if it doesn't match any of these we're just going to print out the number okay this one should print fizz this one should print buzz because this number is divisible by five this number is divisible by three this one's divisible by five and this number is divisible by both 3 and 5. 15 divided by 3 is 5. 15 divided by 5 is 3. So this should print fizz buzz. So what we're going to do is say if my num mod 3 equals 0. So what this is checking is if some number called my num which we haven't defined yet. So we're going to use this as our input variable. And let's first say my num equals number one. Okay. So my num right now at this point equals four. So if my num is uh, mod three, this modular is going to return the remainder of this division. So my num divided by three. And that if that remainder is zero, we're going to print fizz because if the remainder is zero that means it's divisible by three elif my num is divisible by five right my num mod five is zero we're going to print buzz elif my num is divisible by three and my num is divisible by five and we forgot to write the zero okay and let's put these in parentheses just to be safe 
print fizz buzz. And then if it doesn't, print my num. Okay? So there's going to be a trick in here. Um, and I want you to try to think about it and why this current setup won't work, but let's try it. Okay, so we know in this situation, my num equals number one is four. So when we run this algorithm, we should see four in the console. Perfect. Okay, so now let's try number two. So number two is six. And based off of this, we should print fizz. Work so far. Let's try number three. Buzz. Perfect. Okay, because 10 is divisible by 5, so we're going to get a uh, buzz. And now let's do number 4. Hmm. So that only prints fizz. And this is the trick. Because if we were to go through this algorithm, we first check if my num modulo 3 is 0. Well, that's true for 15, right? We know that because it is divisible by 3. So it doesn't even, it's not even able to check if it's divisible by both 3 and 5. So we can move this to the top. It, let's just copy this whole thing. Call this if. This will be elif. And now it should work. Because first it's going to check if it's both divisible by 3 and 5. This is the uh, least likely scenario. And it'll only be divisible by 3 and 5. To return fizzbuzz and then if it's not divisible by both of them it'll check if it's divisible by at least one of them and then if it's not divisible by any of them it should be my num so if we were to run this we get fizzbuzz over here so let's try that again this should be four this number two which equals six should still return fizz this number three which is ten should still return or print buzz, perfect. And then number four, which is 15, should return fizzbuzz. So this is a general application of uh, if statements. Uh, this and right here is new because this is the syntax to check if two different things are, are correct. Um, so let's move right along. The first loop we're going to talk about are while loops, and the idea is that you're going to do something while some condition is true, okay? So it'll be while some condition is true, then you're going to do something, okay? Sorry, that's the general syntax, okay? We're going to comment it out so it doesn't give any issues, but remember that. While some condition is true, we're going to do something, okay? So let's say we want to print all the numbers and including 1 and 100. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We don't want to go through and say print 1, print 2, and then you go all the way down until you say print 100, right? So there's an easy way to do this using while loops. We're going to first say output equals 1, and then while output is less than or equal to 100, you're going to print output and then we'll de uh, increase it sorry about that equals output plus one okay so what this is going to do is first output is one it's going to print out one and then it's going to increase it by one so it'll be two okay and then once it hits the end of this it's going to go back up to the top of the while loop so it'll be output so one plus one is two and then it's going to go back up and print two it's going to redefine output as 2 plus 1, which will be 3. And then it'll go back up, print out 3, and keep on doing that until this condition is false. Okay? And when that condition is false, that means output will be 101, it's going to stop. Okay? So if we're to run this, that's what it does, right? We go all the way to the top, it printed 1, right? Because output was 1, and then it keeps on doing it until it's no longer uh, true which means that it's greater than 100, so it'll stop printing, okay? So that's the first introduction to loops, and the second one we'll go to is for loops. So let's go into for loops. A for loop is a loop that will continue doing the same thing for every object within some parameters. 
okay? And it's typically within, let's say, a list. So let's say we create some list equals to one, two, three, four, five, okay? So all this is is a list of five numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Let's create a, uh, a for loop that will print out every item in this list, okay? So we're gonna say for i, I or let's say item in some list colon. So this is how you will uh, write it, and this is syntactically how it is. So for any item in some list, okay? And this could be, you know, just a list of anything. It could be words or strings, I should say. It could be integers, floats, whatever you want, but it's just for every item. So one is an item, two is an item, three in some list, okay? We're gonna say print item, okay? We're gonna print or run and look at the one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So it's printing every item for item in some list. Okay. So there's also a, a cool thing in Python for for loops where you can actually get the counter as well. So we're going to say for K V in enumerate of some list. So K stands for key. V stands for value. That's typically just how I do it when I'm going through, uh, you know, just, just some list because it'll tell me what item and then the value of the item. We could say like counter and then value just to make it easier. Okay. So we're going to say print counter value. Okay. So what is going to happen? We're going to run it. It's going to print the counter, then the value right next to it, then it's going to go to the next one. So when we create this enumerate method, or when we write this enumerate method, it's going to create another uh, variable we can call called counter, okay? And it's going to print it out starting at zero, so zero, one, two, three, four, and then it's going to go to value, or print the value, and the value is actually going to be the value in the list. Okay, so let's say we have a really long list and we don't want to have to go through every single item, right? We just know for every, for some, whatever reason, we want to be able to print out the th uh, item in index three. So all you would need to do is say print some list in the, uh, we'll say counter. Okay, let's start off with that. Okay, so now it's the same thing but we're using the counter. So zero, one, two, three, four, if that makes sense. So if you can follow this, it's starting at zero. So counter's at zero. So the first time it goes through, it's gonna print some list in the zero, okay? Then we're gonna to go to one and it's gonna print some list in the one. It's gonna keep on going through. So let's say for some reason, we wanted to you know, just write something where we wanna print it when the counter is three, like we said earlier. Okay, if counter equals three, then print some list in the counter. So if we run this, what's gonna happen? It's just gonna print at once in the third, or in the third index. Sorry about that. In the third index, which is four. So zero, one, two, three. All right? These are for loops. Um, we kind of went a little bit more than just for loops. We use some logic within it. But just remember, it's, the syntax is typically for item in whatever you want to go through, uh, and then you could just do whatever logic you want. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the function section of this course, and we're going to learn how to create functions. Functions are reusable pieces of code that you can um, just repeatedly use throughout your project. Uh, it's really good and efficient to use them because uh, you don't have to constantly retype code. So let's say you wanted to get an average of a certain list that you have. So you have a list one, two, three. You can create code to uh, save the average and do that every time you want the average. Or you can create a function. And this using this def keyword to define a function. Then you send in arguments, do some logic, and then return a value. Okay. So using this syntax, we can actually reuse this line of code to create or to find the average of a list of numbers. So if we were to run this in our console, we get two, right? Because the average of one, two, and three is two. All right, so let's get right into it. So let's talk about function terminology. We're gonna hear a lot, so let's kind of look at one that's already set up and look at what we call different things. So 
First, we have our function definition. And this right here is our function definition. This is where we actually define the function and what it does. Uh, that's using this keyword def. In Python, there's uh, other ways to do it in other programming languages, but def is how you do it in Python. Uh, then we have the function name, which is my function. Uh, this could be named anything. It could be named my function two. It could be named motorcycle. It could be named anything, right? Um, and then we are sending in our arguments. Once again, the arguments can be named anything you want. It could be, you know, some arg, some other arg. It could really be anything you want. Uh, then we have our code in here that says what we want the function to do. So since we started to change some stuff, uh, let's copy this and this. So we're now referring to our function arguments and now we're returning uh, what we want uh, our function to really do and return back to the program. Okay, so this is the function definition and these are the arguments, this is the name. Okay, then over here, this is when we call the function. So this means that we are asking Python to actually execute the function. We change the name, so let's do that. And we can, since it's returning this argument here, arg3, we can save that value in my var. So when we call this function, it's actually returning a value that once it returns it, it's gonna save it in my var. And then when we print my var, we go over here and it's five, right? Because we're sending in two arguments. Uh, it's adding them and then returning them. All right, don't expect to understand everything right now. We're gonna go more into it um, once we uh, you know, can actually see the terminology in action. So now let's go into the idea of the return in a function. So let's say we were to you know, define a function called my function, arg1, arg2 with a colon, right? Then we have print three and four, or the word just arg1 and arg2, right? If we look at this, we're printing out these two arguments, but what happens, right? We just print it. Sometimes we want to create functions that return a value. And what that means is when we call this function, the function will actually give back a specific value. And we do that with the return keyword. So let's say we wanted to return arg1 plus, let's just do arg1, okay? When we call the function, my function three comma four and run it, we see three and four. But what actually happened is the function returned a value of arg1. So if we were to print out, we see three, four, and then three, right? Because when we print my function, it calls the function, executes all the lines of code. So first it's going to print this, which it does, and then it'll return uh, a value of arg1. And our arg1, or argument one, our first argument here is three. So it'll print out whatever value is returned. So if we were to get rid of this and say return arg1 plus arg2, what do you think is going to happen? Well, it should get arg1 and arg2, so 3 and 4, and return arg1 plus arg2. So when we print it, we should get 7. And that's exactly what we do. So once you hit the return statement, the function stops and just returns whatever's va whatever value it is. And the great thing is you can actually use it to define functions. So let's say we wanted to say is my sum equals my function of arg1. We'll say 3 actually and 4. If we were to run it, well, nothing happens because we didn't print anything. But if we were to do my, print my sum now, we get seven, right? Because my sum equals my function three comma four, you're sending these two arguments to the function, and then it's gonna return arg one, three plus arg two, four, which equals seven. So now right here, my sum equals seven, but we're not printing anything until we say print my sum and we get it in the console. All right, so that's it for the return statements. So we had looked at this fizzbuzz 
algorithm in the past where if a number is divisible by 3 and 5, so the number modulo 3 is 0 and 5 is 0, it prints fizzbuzz. Otherwise, if it's just divisible by 3, it's going to print fizz. And if it's just divisible by 5, it's going to print buzz. Otherwise, it's going to print the number. And this should actually be m y num. OK? And this is great and all, but what if we want to make it a little bit more dynamic? Well, this would be a great way to turn this into a function. We want to keep this uh, logic, but put it into a function. And we'll see why this is useful. So first, we're going to say def fizzbuzz, and you're going to put in an argument, OK? So we're going to say arg1, or we, you can name it whatever you want, OK? So let's say number 1, all right? Colon. We're going to take all this and indent it. So already, let's just put number, actually. Already, we've defined this function, but Right now, within the scope of this function, we want it to look at number, whatever is being sent to the function. So we're going to put number. All right, and let's copy and paste this. OK. And what this is saying is we're going to give this function, fizzbuzz, a number. OK. And if that number that we send to the function is divisible by 3, in and divisible by five, it's going to print fizz buzz. Otherwise, if it's just three, it'll print fizz five buzz. Otherwise, it's going to print the number. But let's turn this into a return. Okay, if we were to return fizz buzz and then return fizz and then return buzz and then return number, okay. So now it's not just going to print it. We can actually save that value if we wanted to use it for anything else. OK, so let's get rid of my num. And we've just turned fizzbuzz into a function. So we can say um, my result equals fizzbuzz of 15. If we print my result, we get fizzbuzz, OK? So let's say we wanted to see if two numbers have the same result, right? And so we'll say my other result equals fizzbuzz of 30. So let's print my result and my other result. And both of them are fizzbuzz. So now we've taken this code and we can call it multiple times. So creating functions make it a lot easier to organize your code because you can call these functions multiple times and it organizes all your code in one area. OK, so we can see in this situation now if we were to just do my result equals my other result. It's true, right? Because they're both returning fizzbuzz. OK, so this is really good to know when you're creating code because you want to organize your code and if you need to repeat yourself you don't want to have to type all the code again you just want to create one piece of code and then call that piece of code whenever you want to and that's where functions come in handy all right since we learned about functions we're going to learn about recursion now so recursion is a way that you can use functions that you can actually call the function within the definition of function or within the function itself okay so what does that really mean let's first look at a non-recursive function example let's say we wanted to count down every number to zero get you input a number and it's going to go you know let's say 10 it'll go 9 8 7 6 5 all the way down to 1 okay so we'll say count number while number is greater than or equal to zero print the number and then number equals number minus one okay so if you look at this we're going to get a number and while it's greater than or equal to zero it's going to print it then it's going to decrease it so if it's 10 okay it's greater than or equal to zero it'll print 10 then it's going to equal nine it's going to keep on going through so if we look on our console and we say count 10 and run it we see 10 through zero okay but 
this function is really just doing one thing over and over again and this is a great way to recursively call the function so we can rewrite this function let's get rid of all of it and say print number okay so if you put in 10 it's first going to print out 10 then if number is not equal to zero return count of number minus one so if we look what happens let's say we put in 10 it's going to print out 10. that if number is not equal to zero it's going to return the count of number minus one okay so what does that mean let's look at it all right so it goes from 10 9 8 all the way down to zero okay so this is a way where you can actually call this function count this is the same function as here and all it's doing is once you call this it's going to go back in here and recursively call the function okay this could mean a lot or be a lot and we're actually going to look at an example we're going to look at a fibonacci sequence now um so a Fibonacci sequence is such that every number in the sequence is the sum of the two preceding numbers, uh, as we can see in Wikipedia, right? So that means that f of n, so at any given point, equals the sum of f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. So this would be like 3 and then 2 and 1. So this uh, notation just so shows which entry in the sequence it is. So f of 3, or f sub 3, would be the third number in the sequence, equals f sub n minus 1, so 3 minus 1, 2, and then f of 1, right? So that means that this, the third number in the sequence, equals the value of the second number of the sequence plus the value of the first number in the sequence, okay? And we can look at this pretty easily in, you know, the first few values, right? So let's pick one 8. 8 equals 5 plus 3, okay? 21 equals 13 plus 8 and you can do this for every number and it just keeps on going up okay so let's actually program this recursively in python we'll create our function called def fibonacci and it's going to put in some number and our goal is we're going to input the number so it's which number in the sequence it is and is going to return the value okay so f sub 0 is 0 and f sub 1 is 1. So we know if we input 0, it's going to be 0. Otherwise, if it's 1, we're going to output 1. So let's start that. If number equals 0, we're going to return 0. Elif number equals 1, we're going to return 1. Okay? So this is where we're going to get into the recursive part. This, to, you know, is easy because we already have these as givens. But now we have to look at it, okay, f sub n equals f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. But we can look at this just as a function, right? This function of a number equals the same function of the number minus 1 plus the same function of the number minus 2. So we return that. And the way we type that in would be else fib return Fibonacci number minus 1 plus Fibonacci number minus 2, okay? So now we're going to have a few tests. Fibonacci in the 0, okay? We'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? And we obviously could have done this in a for loop, and we will. So we'll run it, and we get 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. Okay? So if we were to go back to Wikipedia and we look at the first two, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. That's perfect. Let's say we wanted to output or print the first 100 uh, numbers of the sequence. We can do print, or sorry, for i in range 0, 100. print Fibonacci of i, okay? We run it, oh, simple error. There you go, it's gonna keep on going. 
and it takes longer and longer because of, uh, you know, just, just the complexity of, of the algorithm. And when you learn about big O, you'll understand why it's taking longer and longer and longer. But if we wanted to stay here, we could figure it out. Let's, you know, give the computer a break and stop. But this are, these are all the numbers in the sequence, okay? And we can see 8, 13, 21, 34, 85. We go over here, and it's the same one, okay? So that's it for this lecture, and you have an assignment next. All right, so welcome to the object-oriented programming section, or the object-oriented Python section, to be more specific. Uh, we're going to talk about objects and what exactly they are, why they are used in programming throughout a bunch of different languages. Um, and by the end, we'll be able to do something like this, where you know we have certain you know data types such as integers and lists and floats. But what if you wanted to create something of your own, where you wanted to store information in a structured, ordered way within one particular object? So right now, let's say we wanted to create an object where we can you know ha have different types of cats, right? Different instances of this cat object, and each one of these instances will have a name and an age. And let's say we wanted to be perform methods on these objects like we wanted to you know have it say meow when we wanted it, when we called this method well we could create a variable called my cat and it'll create an instance of this object class cat with a certain name and an age and then we could call different objects or different methods on it such as meow we run it and it'll print out meow uh, if we could also do something like get my cat dot name and print this out. And we'll see furry. All right, so this is what we'll learn to do. Use objects to create a more organized way to store information in your program, all right? Let's jump into creating our first object, okay? So an object is defined by this class keyword in Python. So you type class, that is a keyword in Python that's telling it, hey, I'm going to now define a function, okay, or define a uh, object or class. Sorry about that. So let's say we're gonna do Jared Goff. So Jared Goff is a football player. He's the quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams, okay? So we can now define different attributes, okay? And an attribute is just something to describe the function, okay? So if we were to describe Jared Goff, he has a first name equals Jared. He has a last name, Goff. He has a position, so quarterback. Team, Los Angeles Rams. And a jersey number. 16. Okay, so this object is going to define or describe Jared Goff. Okay, and we run it, nothing's going to happen because we haven't done anything. All we've done is defined the object. But now that we have an object called Jared Goff, we can actually refer to different uh, attributes. So let's say we're going to define a new object called person equals Jared Goff. Okay, so what this is doing is creating a new object instance, okay, that has all of these attributes, okay? So every time we say person we, it equals Jared Goff, that means person now is going to save the, an instance of all this information, okay? What does that really mean? Let's get right into it. If we were to put person dot first name, okay? This dot is going to access one of the attributes. That's how you access the different attributes and properties in objects, okay? You use this dot. And then we'd say the name of the attribute, which is first name, okay? We could do last name, we could do position, we could do team. So if we're gonna run this, Jared dot, or person dot first name is Jared, okay? If we were to do person dot last name, okay? Goff, okay? So our person, is now Jared Goff. Now we could create a bunch of different objects. So, you know, we can do a class called Todd Gurley, who's another football player, and then go through all these same uh, fields, but, or different, same 
properties, but there's a much easier way to do that. Okay, where now when we define person, we can actually dynamically do that instead of having to rely on the same values for the attributes. So we're going to get into that next. As we said at the end of the last video, we want to find a more dynamic way to create objects or instances of objects because we don't want to have to deal with a lot of different, you know, class, whatever the person's name is, and then have to define, okay, we have a new person who's of, you know, object Jared Goff, right? So let's create a more generalized way to do this. We're going to say class football player. Okay. And now we're going to create a object method okay it's called def init okay so this is standard in python it's built in so anytime you use this uh method in it with these two underscores before and after it's going to take initial values for the function for the object instance this is doesn't really mean a whole lot so let's actually start getting into it so we'll understand uh, what that means okay and let's get rid of all this for now, okay? So now we're gonna put all of the values that we want to define. So uh, in any object, you can reference itself using self, okay? So what this is doing is for any instance you define, you want to actually apply certain values to that instance. So let's say for self that first name equals whatever we want it to equal, okay? What do we want it to equal? Well, this is a function, right? So if we were to just ignore this class football player part, just think of this as a function. Well, how would we send a value to the function? Well, we first have to send the value self, okay? That's the, in any object method. Then we're gonna put in first name, okay? Then instead of it being any specific string, we can just say self dot first name is first name. Okay. So now we can define Jared Goff equal to football player, and we're going to send in an argument, Jared. Okay. So what's going to happen is anything you put in this parentheses is going to be sent to this initialization or this init method. Okay and it'll take the argument first name you it is implicit that self is being passed in so you don't need to worry about passing self whenever you uh create a new instance of an object and this is what we're doing we're creating a new instance of football player called jared goff with different attributes and the attribute for the first name is going to be jared okay so if we're to run this it's not going to do anything yet but if we were to print jared Goff dot first name we get Jared okay so now let's add more right we have the last name we have the team we have position and we have jersey number okay so let's say self dot last name equals last name self dot team equals team self dot position equals position and self dot jersey number equals jersey number okay so now we're gonna have to give multiple arguments to this object def uh, object instance right because right now we're just giving the first name we're going to put in golf as the last name for team let's do Los Angeles Rams Position is going to be quarterback, and jersey number is going to be 16, okay? So now we can rerun the code and say Jared Goff dot position. What do you think we're going to get from here? It should be quarterback, and that's exactly what it is. Okay, it's a little confusing. You have the self here. Um, you know, go go through this slow. Try changing different values, changing the names of different attributes because it can be a lot uh, at once. Just to understand what is this init method, what does self mean? Um, there's a lot of resources to help you explain to help explain what self is. Uh, and yeah, so notice though we can change this to anything. We can say Todd Gurley. We can put Todd 
Gurley, but he's still on the Los Angeles Rams, except he's a running back. And his number's 30. Okay, now we don't have Jared Goff anymore. We have Todd Gurley, dot position, and he's a running back, so that's what we'll get. So now you can easily reuse this code whenever you want to define a new football player. Okay, I know that's a lot. Um, the self could be a lot, very confusing. You know, make sure you ask questions in the Q&A section uh, if you come into any problems. And, you know, don't be afraid to Google anything that you uh, may be wondering. Okay, thank you. So right now we're going to talk about object methods and we already covered it a little bit using the uh, built-in init method to initialize uh, different instances of objects. But what if we wanted to make our own? So just to save some time, I created a class dog. So it's an object of class dog. Uh, we have our init function, right? Where we send in self, which we always do, and then name, okay? And then when we create it, it'll be self.name equals name. When we create it, we do dog name equals whatever you want the name to be. And if we were to print buddy dot name, we should get buddy. All right. So this is what we've gotten so far. But let's say we want to add different things that this object can do. Right. We're not just constrained by Python's built in functions or methods. Right. We can add our own. So let's say we wanted to make one bark. So we're going to say def bark send in self. And let's say anytime we call this, we wanted to just output or print bark. Okay. So let's say print bark. Okay. So now let's get rid of this part and just say buddy dot bark. What's going to happen? Well, in the console, we just see now bark, just what we printed out. So this is the simple way just to add a, a simple method to your object so you can actually call it on any instance of the object. So anytime you create a new object or a new instance of this dog object, you'll be able to call all of the methods that you define. Okay, let's take it to a step further and send in our own argument. So let's say we want to have a custom way uh, that you wanted them to say something, right? So you don't want them to just say bark, we'll say speak. And then we're going to say, um, you know, words. Okay. And then when we were going to send in the words that we want the dog to speak. Okay. So what we would do then is words equals I am hungry. So what do we just do? In our definition of the object method or the function, right? This is just a normal function, but it's within the scope of the object. We're sending in a new argument called words. And then we're printing out whatever we're sending it. So when we say buddy.bark, we create, we call the function, and then we have to send in whatever words we want it to say. So we're gonna say, I am hungry. So when we run it, has no, oh, we forgot to change it to speak. I am hungry, right? Because we call the method speak, sent in words equals I am hungry, and we're gonna print it out, okay? So this is how you would create a method. You could create whatever method you want. I would definitely suggest creating more to play around with it. Okay, thank you. Now that we understand objects a little bit more, let's look into an application of creating our own object and overloading a function. Uh, we've already done this by using Python's built-in init method, but we can do that with other functions such as addition, right? If we wanted to add two objects that we've created, we can actually overwrite the addition sign to do what we want it to do. So let's jump right in. We're gonna start by creating an object of a complex number, okay? And what each instance of this object will represent a complex number. What is a complex number? If you don't know, let's go to Wikipedia. And really it's a number that has two parts, a real part, and an imaginary part. So we write it a plus b i, and a is just any real number, and b is a, a number multiplied by i, which is the square root of negative one, okay? So the square root of negative one is assigned the value of i, so it's gonna be a plus b i, okay? So any complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. That's really all you need to know for the context of this. And when you add two complex numbers together, 
you do the real part plus the real par part and the imaginary part plus the imaginary part, okay? So let's get right into it. We have our class complex number. Let's create our initialization class in it self. And we're going to send in a real part and an imaginary part, okay? We're going to say self.real equals real, self.imaginary equals imaginary. And there you go. We just created our uh, initialization method for a complex number. So we can say C1 equals complex number. Uh, and we'll say it's going to be 1 plus 2i. Then we'll say print c1.real, c1.imaginary. Okay. So let's run it. And we should get 1 and 2, right? So this 1 is going to be our real part. So it's going to be the a in this a plus bi. And 2 is going to be the B, the imaginary part in the A plus BI, okay? So now, how, what if we wanted to take two complex numbers that we define? Let's say we define another one, C2 equals complex number of 2 and 5, okay? And we wanted to add those two numbers together, okay? These two complex numbers, which means we have to add 1 and 2, and then 2 and 5. Well, we used Python's built-in method. Add, okay? Self and other. You can name this whatever you want, but this is going to be the other number you'll be adding, okay? So when we define C3 equals to C1 plus C2, C2 will be the other in this scenario, okay? So we're going to create new real equals self.real plus other.real. New imaginary equals self dot imaginary plus other dot imaginary. Now we're going to return a complex number instance. Okay, so we're going to return an instance of our complex number where the real part is the new real. And let's be more explicit in our definition. Real and imaginary equals new imaginary. Okay. So what we're doing is sending it. So C1 has a method called add which when we add, do C1 plus C2, we're going to add self. So it's going to be C1.real plus other.real, which will be C2. And then self.imaginary plus other.imaginary. And this method will return. So when we do equals, it's going to save the value in the C3. So it's going to return a new complex number instance where the real part is new real, which is the adding the two real parts will be one and two and the two imaginary parts, which is two and five. So if we now change this to C3, we should have an output of three and seven. And that's exactly what we have, okay? So I hope this makes sense to you. Um, try not to worry too much about understanding complex numbers as much as understanding why this works and what, how complex numbers are, are added in the context of this object. OK, so it could be any sort of thing, but, you know, you can overwrite add and return any sort of value you want if you wanted to add, add to instances of your object. OK, thank you.